This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. The first speaker is uh, Elaine Mardis from Washington University in St. Louis. She's going to talk about the orangutan genome. Well, thanks very much, uh, Jeet, for the nice introduction and for the opportunity to, to uh, present some work that we recently published uh, earlier this year in Nature. So um, this is an overview of what we were able to identify with an extensive analysis group uh, after sequencing the orangutan genome. So this, of course, is a multidisciplinary approach to analyzing this genome. Uh, it took an international effort to really pull all of this together, uh, combining over 25 participating institutions with investigators with a full spectrum of genetic, genomic, evolutionary, and other uh, uh, areas of interest uh, who were able to help us mine through this uh, large genome uh, space and really make sense out of all of it. And I'll present those findings today. In case you're interested, the, there is a, a comparison to be made here between the distribution of genome analysts and the distribution of orangutans. So the, the, the analysts are shown in blue, the orangutans in yellow and, and pink. And uh, so there's quite a disparity there just right off the bat uh, to understand this genome. So as many of you know, the, the orangs are uh, native to these uh, two islands, Borneo and Sumatra in yellow, Borneo in red and Sumatra in yellow. There are two species, the Bornean and the Sumatran, not surprisingly. And the Bornean are even divided into the three subspecies that you see here. In total, this is a very uh, stressed population group, regardless of which one you're talking about. They're an estimate of about 50,000 Bornean and only 7,000 Sumatran individuals remaining in the wild. Um, and as uh, according to these very small numbers that are ever dwindling, we see that the Borneans are listed as endangered, the Sumatran orangs as critically endangered. So part of this process has really been caused by the extreme loss of habitat shown here. Uh, both orang species are under pressure from the encroachment of man as illustrated by these maps of Borneo. And really the pace of habitat loss has been accelerated and driven by many forces, uh, including the incredible expansion of palm oil plantations, these largely in an effort to generate uh, biomass for um, alternative energy sources. Uh, and I think this really, um, the remarks that I'll talk about today and our analysis of the orang genome overall really highlights the importance of capturing the genetic diversity now so that we can um, somehow aid the, and encourage the continuation of these species throughout time, if at all possible. This is just the fuller story of the orang in terms of comparative and demographic analysis published in Nature earlier this year, as I mentioned, uh, for you to look at for more details. And some of the figures and all the information that I'll show you is essentially distilled out of this uh, multi-international, uh, multi-lab international effort. So uh, just a little bit of basic background on orangs, both in terms of their history as well as their genetics. So the orang is really a Malaysian term for man of the forest. Um, these are really the only primarily ar arboreal great ape species and the only Asian great ape that remains. These uh, live in the vast majority of their lives in the jungle canopy. So um, they use the jungle for shelter, food, and transportation. Previous uh, talks that I've heard on the morphology of orangs show that they're highly adapted for swinging through the trees, if you will, both from the standpoint of musculature and skeletal uh, conformations. And this, of course, allows them to avoid large predators, a couple of which are listed here. And in the very stressed, um, small environment that they're now allowed to live in, they really uh, are thriving only in this jungle swamp that's inhospitable to man. It's their sole refuge. 
The diet is composed mostly of fruit, um, which means good and bad things. They're subject to boom and bust variation in seasonal abundance. And they do, uh, as I'll talk about uh, in subsequent slides, have an ability to um, reduce their energy usage in addition to having, having a fairly low-key lifestyle in general. And uh, in particular, they have a very low resting energy uh, usage rate among mammals. So uh, more on that, the, the orangs have the longest natural lifespan, both in the wild and captivity, that's shown here. And in particular, they also have a very slow growth and reproduction rate, um, the longest birth, uh, inner birth interval uh, known among mammals of about eight years average uh, duration. The uh, ranks are able to create and adeptly use tools, and I found this interesting. There's actually a geographic variation in tool usage, which is a, more of a cultural uh, learning aspect, we think, than anything. This is just a book uh, among orangs that has other interesting um, information in it about uh, the orangs and their lifestyle, if you're interested. So from a genetic standpoint, why study the orangutan? Well, in particular, it's the most distantly related great ape species with respect to humans. And this is going to, as I hope to demonstrate for you in the next few slides, provide us some very insightful perspectives on our own evolution. The orangutan lineage diverged about 12 to 16 million years ago from the common ancestor of all great apes. And in particular, the Bornean Sumatran orangs uh, diverged from one another about 400,000 years ago. And in particular, we think that the Asian distribution and the arboreal lifestyle that I mentioned earlier uh, subjected the orang to divergent population genetic and selective forces when compared to African apes. So as I'll walk you through now, the genome sequence that we were able to assemble and analyze allows us to look at orang-specific features, so there's value in that. And then also use these as a very important outgroup, as I'll also illustrate, uh, to show us trends across both great ape as well as human evolution. So the reference genome was derived from Susie, who is shown here. She is a Sumatran orang housed at the Gladys Porter Zoo in Texas. Uh, the DNA obtained from her blood was uh, obtained during a routine uh, veterinary care visit. And we, from this, we were able to um, sequence to sufficient depth using uh, first-generation sequencing technology, capillary sequencing, a sufficient level to assemble her, her genome uh, to relatively high quality. In addition, and as I think you'll hear from other speakers uh, a bit during the day, um, the nature of genome sequencing is changing quite a bit with what we call next-generation sequencing technology. I'll not dwell on that, but tell you that we use that type of technology along with very important DNA resources that we were able to obtain from Oliver Ryder at the San Diego Zoo, um, five Bornean and five Sumatran orangs, a mix of males and females, to further understand the diversity in these species relative to the sequenced individual. We utilize this using Illumina sequencing technology. Illumina is actually located here in the San Diego area. And um, this allowed us to generate these data from these 10 additional genomes for a relatively small amount of money per genome, as shown here, relative to what it costs to sequence the whole genome of Susie. From these data, we were able to develop a database of polymorphisms, so single base differences between Susie's genome and any other of the orangs that we uh, sequenced. And this is going to be, we think, a very important resource moving forward, not only to understand the divergence between the two species, the Bornean and the Sumatran, as well as their relationship to human, but also to provide a deep resource for conservation efforts and diversity studies. So what did we learn from sequencing the genome? There's sort of a laundry list thrown up here for you if you're able to digest it in the time that I have the slide shown. But I, I actually will delve into some specific details about what we found as shown here. In general, we um, found the genome to have unique features compared to the chimpanzee and human genomes. In many ways, as you read through this list, you'll see the word slow. And this, I guess, if one's lifestyle can recapitulate one's genome or vice versa, um, this is sort of a harbinger um, given the relatively uh, relaxed pace with which orangs uh, go through life. 
In addition, as I mentioned earlier, we um, uh, use this information, the Bornean Sumatran comparison, to model the speciation uh, events. And we were able, in this regard, to show a much more recent split than previous estimates, as well as other uh, specific features. So I'll go through some of those now for you. Phylogeny is always of interest to us, of course, and sequencing this outgroup is important, as shown here. Orangs are about 97% identical to humans at the genetic level, and if we compare the two species to one another, about 99.7% identical. And this is roughly comparable to the bonobo chimpanzee distance that was mentioned earlier. I should point out that both the bonobo and gorilla genome projects are underway, and so we'll have a very very, very full picture of primate uh, great ape evolution as we uh, move forward in time. Earlier in time, the, uh, there was a description of an inversion event on the orang chromosome using uh, conventional cytogenetic approaches that was described as a so-called neocentromere. In our work, however, in the uh, orang genome analysis, we were able to show that this was really not a new centromere, but rather um, just a repositioning event of the existing centromere, shown by the orderly uh, format of these markers on the chromosomes um, shown here. So this is not an inversion, and this is something that we were able to show uh, coming out of the genome sequencing data, along with other features of these um, particular neocentromere areas. We also looked very carefully at gene family evolution. This is a way uh, where you look uh, between primates and other mammals to evaluate gene gain or gene loss events per family of genes in a, over a millions of year period. And what we found coming out of this was that the highest turnover rate in gene families is observed in the chimp and human lineages. By comparison, the orang lineage has a rate about comparable to the rhesus macaque, which is half the chimp human rate. So their overall gene family evolution rate also seems to be quite slow, as uh, shown by other features of the genome. We also use this type of information to look for evidence of positive selection in specific gene families. Um, this is maybe a sign of what makes a species unique. The orangutan branch, because it's this outgroup uh, relative to humans, gives us an improved power to detect these genes that are rapidly evolving. So this analysis was basically done across 12,000 genes that were found to be shared between dog, rhesus, orang, chimp, and human genomes, as shown here in the full analysis of these uh, uh, genes. Um, in terms of where we could detect um, orthologs and how they had changed over time. In particular, one of the types of genes that we identified as being uh, dramatically different are these six genes that fall in this uh, lipid metabolism pathway. Um, these all have moderate to strong signals of positive selections in primates, and in particular, they are known to cause these significant lysosomal storage diseases in humans, uh, some of which are very well known, uh, especially in, in, in human genetic circles. Um, and this uh, may indicate a link between rapidly evolving genes and specific neurobiological pathways, so therefore uh, merits more investigation. And lastly, what do orangutans tell us about ourselves? Well, first of all, the slow evolution of the orang genome highlights the acceleration of structural rearrangement in our African ancestors. In, in other words, not all great ape species followed the same formula for evolution. This further emphasizes the close relationship to us between humans and, and chimps at the genetic level, although if you look at the chimp genome uh, relative to the human, it's even more highly uh, rearranged uh, when we compare that to the ancestral species. Uh, in addition, the, the orangutan outgroup, as I've described, helps to identify rapidly evolving genes in primates, and this interesting example in lipid metabolism pathway genes, uh, I think, it, uh, highlights that, especially in terms of our propensity to diseases that are not found in other uh, great apes. The genomic data provide a granularity and resolution on genomic events that surpass the cytogenetic observations done years ago, and I illustrated that with the neocentromere uh, identity that we came up with. And lastly, and I think as importantly as anything, um, we hold the future of the orang species in the palm of our hand, and it would be great to be able to take these uh, genetic diversity uh, information from the SNP database that we've developed 
to um, uh, guide uh, critical management decisions um, that can be obtained um, by sampling those orangs that still remain in the wild. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and in particular to acknowledge here the Orang Genome Analysis Consortium with, without which all of these um, amazing analyses and many that I didn't have time to talk about were done. I especially like to acknowledge my good friend Oliver Ryder and, and his sidekick Leona uh, without whom we wouldn't have had these important uh, Bornean and Sumatran orangs to compare and, and provide the wealth of the SNP database. And I'd like to especially acknowledge my postdoc, Devin Locke, who is uh, front and center. He's first author on the, the paper in Nature uh, and was really integral to bringing this analysis team together, writing up the results and seeing them uh, uh, published uh, earlier this year. And especially to thank the NHGRI for their funding of this uh, and, and support of this effort. Thanks very much. <laughs>